brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. After my last video where I made an announcement of a new project, I have been even thinking deeper about the new project and the point is that uh, I already planned that for years and very long and very long time in German. And in German I have been breeding about a name for the study, uh, I want, the way I want to call that. And a few weeks ago, all of a sudden, I had a wonderful idea of how I'm going to name that study. Because in the German study that is going to come, I plan, I don't say that that will actually be done this way, but I absolutely plan to read four books in one study. And those are not books of each 50 or 60 pages or something. No, uh, one even has more than 500 pages. The other one is not even finished yet. <laughs> is written in English and not even finished yet and needs to be translated afterwards. It's a monumental task to do, but it is something that God really drives me, the Holy Spirit really drives me to do since a long time already. It is so dear to me and in English, because that's what's concerning the viewers of this video the most, I actually already started with this. There was one video I or one study that was very dear to my heart, but that in English I did not express that deeply my motivation of as I'm going to do that in German. And the English study is the last one you've, saw, uh, you, you've seen with me uh, when I went together with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update and we uh, read and discussed the book from Steve Wahlberg, The Seventh-day Adventist. Yes, I know, Seventh-day Adventist. The Jew, yes, I know, a Jew, of end-time deception and then, of course, in the end, exploding the Israel deception. A, for the most part, wonderful book that needs here and there a little correction and a little commentary. And that's exactly what Tom and I did. It is Tom's work, of, it was Tom's work and still is, uh, to expose futurism, the greatest lie since the deception, uh, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. <laughs> I was mixing up the sentences, sorry. The greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, or, uh, already a video I did with Tom, I think in 2015, years and years and years ago. And after that, Keith Kampschafer made a wonderful video concerning the 70th week of Daniel that is even linked in the description box of my, uh, of my video, The Greatest Deception Since the Garden of Eden, that you can watch. It's also, I think, about two hours long. It's a wonderful video that Keith produced there. It's uh, actually even better than <laughs> the thing that Tom with a few other guests of me and myself did in 2015. But anyway, that led us up to the reading and discussion of the book End Time Deception by Steve Wahlberg and surely exploding the Israel deception because um, most Christians in this world today have a wrong understanding of the role Israel plays in the end times. And especially since in 1948 the Antichrist founded the nation state of Israel that was already planned long time ago. That is all part of the futurist agenda that first was made public in the end of the 16th century by the writing of Francisco Ribera and his futuristic uh, commentary that he gave on the Apocalypse or the Book of Revelation. Now, the point is, the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden to me is even much bigger than just, quote unquote just, I don't want to belittle futurism, but quote unquote just futurism. And futurism is much bigger much bigger than what 
Tom and I even have been talking about so far. Because it does not only deal with the point that there is, according to the futurist agenda, one future Antichrist that will come about seven years before Jesus Christ comes back and then there will be great tribulation and there will be a rapture, whether a pre-trip rapture, mid-trip rapture or post-trip rapture. People are not sure about that, but they think they're all going to be raptured out here. And we all discussed that, these flaws in, in the book uh, reading and discussion of Steve Wahlberg's book, End Time Deception. Uh, we all know that that is a deception. But if you thought that that, all is, is that that is all the futurist agenda, you are very, very much mistaken. The study that I'm going to start today is a study where I cannot reveal everything because I haven't even studied everything. I haven't laid the ground on everything. Um, but I know that this will be a long study. This will be a long, long work, this study, of which I give you the name in a moment. Not only because it involves uh, a few books, as I said already, in German it uh, involves four books. In English it involves actually, as I planned, the same four books, of which Exploding the Israel Deception I have already finished with Tom Fress, so you have to include this into this study. Um, but I am studying since two years, and for the moment, uh, at least two days a week, very deeply the subject of futurism. <laughs> In that regard, that futurism is much bigger than the point that I just mentioned, future antichrist, uh, quote-unquote rapture, uh, quote-unquote tribulation, you, you know all that, uh, and we debunked already that, but it's, it's so much bigger. And it not only involves the teaching and false teaching, of course, of the Roman Catholic Church. No, but it also involves false teaching of other churches. I'm a little bit reluctant to say all other churches, as a matter of fact, because I don't know all churches. So maybe there is a church here and there that really tells the truth. I've never heard of one, but it's possible. I don't want to be judgmental on that, and I don't want to be presumptuous on that. But the point is... I tell you that futurism is much bigger than the little subject we talked about already. Futurism is so deceptive in the whole book of a wrong explanation of the book of Daniel and of the book of Revelation together that I cannot grasp it for the moment even myself even though I really opened the door and was led by the Holy Spirit to look already behind the curtain to see what is not told to us and how big the deception really is. I saw a glance of that, a glimpse, but not all of it. That's why I'm saying my study is still ongoing, forthgoing, continuing. It is about the book of Daniel, it is about the book of Revelation, it is about all quote-unquote Protestant churches, it is not only about the Lutheran, the Baptist, the Methodist, the, uh, and, and, and all these other kinds of denominations, but first of all, it is, one, it is about the biggest uh, quote-unquote denomination, the biggest quote-unquote Protestant denomination known in the world today, which is the Seventh-day Adventists. And the study that I will bring forth, and for a part, at least as I plan it for the moment, I will do the study alone. But in the future, it is very well possible that my brother Tom from Inquisition Update will join me. And it is also very much possible that another brother will join me, whose name I will not reveal yet. That is also of no importance. But... Um, we are doing the studies together and it is very much possible that those two brothers will join me in the recording of at least parts of the study. And even if it is just occasionally, yeah, not permanent like Tom and I did the whole book of Steve Wahlberg together, but more or less here a little and there a little. When I feel I need the support of my brothers 
and also when they want to support me and want to be part of the study. I cannot make anyone, anyone to join me in this and anyone who joins me in this has of course to do the same studies and we are doing these studies with three brothers in Christ doing these studies every week at least two days normally two days a week and it's very very time consuming and yeah I'm not a I'm not a bigger writer so I don't write much down um, the point is <laughs> uh, there's a lot of things that I've studied and that I have forgotten already <laughs> I'm not getting any younger anyway but I'll, I'll see to it that in the future I can get to you the most important stuff that we are all, always talking about and especially the most important points. We will show to you that there is a real biblical, absolutely sense-making explanation to many points of the book of Daniel. And I'm not even mentioning them right now because Otherwise, I know there are people going in the comments berserk on this and write this and write that. I will only tell you we will deal with a lot of subjects in Daniel and in the book of Revelation, especially in Revelation chapter 13, where Tom and I already went to when we did Exploding the Israel Deception. We went through uh, in, in a few videos to the view of all the reformers, reformers before the Protestant Reformation, during the time of the Reformation and after the time of the Reformation, and what was their point of view of, for example, the two beasts of Revelation chapter 13. And there were a few that had a view that is not very common and very popular in this world, and that is a view that not only Tom, my other brother and I share, but that we are sure that we can give you the right biblical um, texts to back it up with to make sure to tell you that and ta-da United States of America is not the second beast of Revelation 13 here I said it and I will back it up with the Bible at a later moment now the study that I'm going to do I chose a name and that name is yay has God said. The words the serpent spoke in the Bible to Eve when the serpent questioned what God had said. Yea, has God said? Why am I calling the study this? Now first of all this name popped into my head a few weeks ago when I was thinking about how in the world am I going to name this German study because I knew what I, what, I, what I was going to study I knew exactly what I was going to tell the people but I had no idea of the name so all of a sudden it came to me that I was led to well the point is with yea hath God said the word of God every word is questioned instead of trusting in God and being obedient to what he says the word is questioned that is what the serpent did in the Garden of Eden through the way the serpent of course the way the serpent is pictured here is not how the serpent in the garden looked but that's another discussion <laughs> not one I'm gonna busy myself with during this study but because of bringing Eve to disobedience, she brought her man to disobedience, Adam to disobedience of the word of God. So the first Adam fell into disobedience and by his fall brought sin and death into the world. Now the Bible says in the what most people refer to as the New Testament, which I like to prefer to as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, which is the Old Testament. The Bible in the New Testament says that through one man's disobedience, death came into the world, and through one man's obedience, life came into the world. 
And this obedience is the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, the understanding who or what Jesus Christ is, is also in all churches, not only the Roman Catholic Church, but in all churches wrong. Because we have to understand when we go back to the Reformation, the Reformation was a time when people led by the Spirit of God came out of her, the Church of Babylon, that is referred to in Revelation chapter 18 verse 4, come out of her my people that you be not partakers of her sins and they don't, uh, and they don't receive of her plagues because God has remembered her iniquities. People led by the Holy Spirit were led out of the church, but they all came from the Roman Catholic Church because there was no other church in the world. There was the only church in the world. So all the founders of the so-called Protestant denominations that we have today in the world are all, when you go back to the roots, Roman Catholics. And Tom Fress has very famously stated a sentence that I very much like to repeat here, but I'd like to give him the credit, of course. He said, it is one thing to take a man out of Catholicism, but it is nigh to impossible to get Catholicism out of a man. And when we take that into consideration about the time of the Reformation and all the reformers, especially, I pick, for example, Luther, because, you know, I'm German, my name is Jörg, that's the same name that Luther chose, Junker Jörg, when he was on the Wartburg translating the Bible in 1521. So I feel I have like a, <laughs> how do you say that? I have a bone for him. <laughs> I, I, I like Luther. I, I like everyone. I like all the reformers, even though they had their, fa their faults. Luther had his faults. Luther was a Mariologist. He worshipped the worship uh, the, the um, he worshipped the the Virgin Mary. He prayed the Rosary. He even in his um, Protestant times. As far as I know, as far as I'm, I've learned of him, um, still was uh, taking the Eucharist in the Roman Catholic way. And if not, I excuse for that. But anyway, uh, being a Mariologist or a uh, someone who, who appreciates the Virgin Mary as she is taught in the Roman Catholic Church and someone who prays the Rosary, you see that there was still a lot of Roman Catholic leaven over in Luther. And it was the same with Calvin. And it was the same with Zwingli. It was the same with a lot of Roman Catholics who came out of her in the name of the Reformation. Nobody was perfect. You are not perfect. I am not perfect. Far from it. I don't want to be perfect. <laughs> because I know only one man was nigh to perfect and is nigh to perfect, Jesus Christ. And he is perfect in all ways, especially in the way of obedience. He is the only man that lived on this world who was from the moment that he was born until the moment that he gave up the ghost was obedient to the Father. And this obedience was not only uh, Counted on, uh, accounted for him for righteousness. But this obedience fulfilled the prophecy that God said in chapter 3 and verse 15 of the book of uh, Genesis, where we have here verse 1, Yea, hath God said. When we go to verse 15, and God says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the very first time we hear of Jesus Christ. We hear of the salvation for mankind, who has just fallen, who, mankind, has just fallen into disobedience and idolatry and Yeah, later on, worshipping other gods. I, I don't say right here in the Garden of Eden, but, you know, 
it was disobedience that made man fall. Okay, and here we have the very first um, mentioning of Jesus Christ. There is another mentioning of Jesus Christ in the Bible uh, in the first five books of Moses that I like very much to bring to your attention. And that is when we go to the book of Deuteronomy. And there we go into chapter 18 and verse 18. We scroll down, we see here, and this is God speaking to Moses. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. This prophet that will be raised among the brethren, like unto Moses, whose words God puts in his mouth, this is talking about Jesus Christ. And we are going to do a very deep study of the subject of all over the world falsely taught the Trinity. The Trinity, the three God and one, only works when you believe that Jesus was God. But you can look up the Bible from here, Genesis, to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, and you will not find any one verse where it speaks of three gods in one. When God speaks of himself, he speaks of himself as being one. For example, we go back to Deuteronomy, that is one of the main important verses in the whole of the study. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It is called Shema or Shma. Here, that is the word Shma in Hebrew. Shma Israel, the Lord, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Now, in the later part, because this is not the beginning of the study, this is just an introduction to what's going to come, we will see that even Jesus Christ repeated these two sentences, these two verses of Deuteronomy, word for word in the New Testament. And the name of the study, Yea, hath God said, is because we're going to look at what God said. We're going to look at what the Bible said. Yeah, that is why this is the most close to a Bible study I've ever done. And you have to understand me. I don't want to make excuses or whatever, but I'm going to explain to you. I am not a Bible scholar. I'm only someone who reads the Bible and understands it for himself. And I have to do these videos also as a way of a um, excuse. Because when I very first came to the belief, now some, I don't know, 10 years or so ago, through the studies of worldly affairs, because that's no secret. Everybody who watches my very first video and nothing but the truth with Michael Adams interview, uh, my, uh, my, my uh, trip from, uh, I don't even know how, it, how it's called anymore, my journey from unbeliever to disciple or something like that. You can look that up in the nothing but the truth um, I think from 2014 or, or a very, very, very beginning of 2015 that was published. I tell how I came from all the worldly studies that I did and, and how I was motivated to do these studies all of a sudden at 45 years of age. Um, how I came from these studies to, to the belief, to the belief of 
the one Christian God. And from the beginning it was very clear to me that Jesus Christ is man, not God. But when I then became interested in learning more about God, I did one major mistake. Major mistake. I went to go to listen to other people. I went to go to listen to other men. I watched, and I can only call, give you this example because this is the most uh, burned into my memory. I watched the video series Total Onslaught by Walter Feit in German and in English, the whole series at least twice in both languages. I watched a lot of those videos of the Seventh-day Adventist, and it all seemed so right and so correct. And not only within the Seventh-day Adventist, but also within all kinds of other churches. Even in a subtle way, the Trinity was taught. And even though that I didn't have a Trinitarian mindset from the beginning, because I never understood the quote-unquote Godhead, as it was explained in the Bible, especially when you read 1 John 5, 7. <laughs> and that's going to be an interesting subject when you go to that part of the Bible. I never understood the Godhead. I could never understand how could Jesus pray in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross, to the Father, and ask the Father, Please, Father, let this cup pass me by. But not my will be done, but your will be done. And so many other occasions. Occasions during the Gospels. Occasions during uh, the, the time after, um, after his death, the resurrection. Yeah? When, he, when he went up to heaven. When you read the book of Hebrews, uh, not through a Territarian uh, uh, glasses, all of a sudden you get a completely different understanding of that. You get a completely different understanding of the whole New Testament, probably even of the whole New Old Testament, quote-unquote, uh, the law and the prophets, as I like to call it. You get a whole new understanding of the Bible. And do you know why I can tell you that? With confidence? Because it is the same when you understand futurism and all of a sudden you read the Bible, the New Testament, and, and only the New Testament, for example, yeah, the fulfilling, the fulfillment. You read the New Testament with the understanding that the papacy is the Antichrist. All of a sudden you read a complete New Testament, completely different. Because in almost every verse you see the Church of Babylon come out and you understand the Church of Babylon, the synagogue of Satan, the man of perdition, the Son of um, the the son of perdition the son of perdition and the man of man of sin uh, those are the terms um, Paul uses those in Second Thessalonians two to describe the Antichrist the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan and the vicar of Satan is not the vicar of Christ it's it's actually the vicar of Satan is the Pope he is the Vicarius Filii Dei of the God of this world, meaning of this world time. That's again, I don't want to go too deep into this. That's why I'm saying this is just an introductory to the study that is coming. An introduction to the study that's coming. And this study will be filled for the first with the book reading I told you already, except uh, Exploding the Israel Deception, that I've already done with Tom. Now, my part that I'm going alone for is the next one, and that is this book. It is called The Origin of the Doctrine of the Trinity. It is a book from the 19th century. It is written by Hugh H. Stannis. It has appeared in 1882. It has about 112 pages. And this book I will read in English. I will also read this book in German because it is translated into German. But that's the German study. And after this, I will hopefully pray with me 
to read another book that is not even yet finished, but that is in the closing stages of being finished. It's about two, three months away from being finished. And when that book is finished, I will also ask a German sister to translate it into German. And that book we will read. And that book is giving you a completely new look on the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and also of other things, but those are the major points where you get a complete new understanding and a biblical understanding because everything will be measured at the Bible. I, I want to tell you what is my motivation to tell you <laughs> say Jörg's motivation come on uh, what is my motivation why I want to show with you that the book um, that, that the Trinity is a false doctrine and I want to get you to the real understanding of the Bible when we go to the book of Acts in the New Testament, which is the very first book after the Gospels, eh? you have uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and then you have the book of Acts, and then you have the beginning of Paul bringing the Gospel to the Gentiles with the book of Romans. In the book of Acts, we have in chapter 17 a very important, a very important part. And... Um, this part is when we go into um, verse, now where is that here, uh, it's later on, I think it is verse 11, verse 10 and 11. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by the night unto Berea, who, coming thither, went into the synagogue of the Jews. These, speaking of the Jews in Berea, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, these are very important um, points to me and should be to every Christian. We should measure everything. I even forgot to put a picture of the Bible here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I didn't prepare everything and I didn't prepare it well, but you know, here's a picture of my most favorite Bible, the King James Bible of 1611. The brethren sent away Paul and Silas met the they met the Jews in the synagogue of Berea, and those Jews in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They measured everything in this world at the Bible. The Bible was their basis. Now that is what every Christian professes. But out of my own experience, ashes upon my head, I can say it is not what every Christian does. It is not what I did. It is what I'm going to better myself in. I have to become more obedient to God too. I guess like everyone else. But I'm not judging everyone before I have not judged myself. And second of all, I'm not going to judge anyone either. I just wanted to give, I want to give advice. Now, Am I a good one to give advice to anybody else when I still not know my ass from uh, from the beginning? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I can only tell you um, the way that I have walked so far is a very, very narrow path. And here and there I stumbled a little bit. Oh, stumbling. <laughs> that gives me another idea. Stumbling. I'm going to tell you. Do you know why we Christians cannot bring the gospel to uh, to the Jews because we 
quote-unquote Christians sell Jews a Jesus that does not exist. Romans 11, 11 says, I say then have they stumbled that they should fall, speaking of the Jews? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles to provoke them for jealousy. So we Gentiles who have gotten the salvation of the Jews because they failed to accept it, they felt they fell down and did not accept it, we got it. We are here to provoke them to jealousy. Now, how can we bring the Jews to salvation? How can we bring anyone to salvation? To get to know Jesus Christ, right? But how are you going to teach Jesus Christ to the Jews when you teach them a not Son of God, but a God the Son. When you teach them a God they do not know. When you teach them a God they do not pray to. What is the God the Jews pray to? Hear, O Israel, our Lord the God is one Lord, not three. So even a little bit further in the book of Acts chapter 17 Paul comes to the next point which I find so so fantastic and important. Verse 22 Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity but towards thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be graft in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if I were if, if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and wert graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be graft into their own olive tree? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so, shall, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away godliness from Jacob. Now, the point that I actually wanted to read to you is another verse. And that verse is in, uh, I think it is chapter 23, if I'm not mistaken. Now I have to, I'm, I'm in Romans here, sorry. <laughs> oh, that's why I was reading. Okay, Romans 11, that, that's a good one. No, but I, I was... I was looking in Acts, sorry, I had on the, uh, the wrong page. Everything of Romans chapter 11, of course, is wonderful, but it deals all with the point spoken out, uh, spoken of in Romans 11, 11. Yeah? Um, no, but I was looking in uh, Acts. So, we have the Bereans that were no more noble than the Jews in Thessalonica, in that, that they received the word with all readiness of mind. What does that mean? They left out their presuppositions. They were, in receiving the word, like children who have a clear mind, who have not been yet indoctrinated with the lies of this world. So they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, a little bit further on in this chapter, and that's the one that I was looking for, Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now, um, let me tell you one thing. We all are strong in our superstitions. And we never or hardly question our superstitions, but we always question our faith. 
not our superstitions. That is because we are all made of this corruptible flesh. But we need to be born again in the spirit and in truth through Jesus Christ. And with these people the same. And he thinks, I perceive in all things ye are too superstitious. Now he says, and this, listen, is it. This is a very, very, very important verse. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription. To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I to you. What do many Jews in the past and heathens have in common? Well, I'm speaking most of the Jews of the Old Testament before the Babylonian captivity, because then they ran after other, after other gods. But what do the heathen, the Gentiles, the pagans all have in common? They are in search of a god, and they are devoted to their gods. Huh? I beheld your devotions. They are devoted to their god, or their gods, and they want to worship him, but they don't know how. Well, why didn't they know how, Jörg? Well, because they did not have the Bible. So they built an altar to the unknown God. The unknown God even most Christians call the Trinity, because they cannot make sense out of it. Uh, you can say, oh, God is like water. It's frozen, it's fluid, and it's moisture or it's like an egg <laughs> the outer part the white part and the yellow part <laughs> but god is neither an egg nor water <laughs> god is one god one unique god one all-knowing spirit the father yahweh and he has one only begotten son and he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for the whole world. That is the message, that is the gospel that needs to be preached. And by that you will know this unknown God, to which in this case here the people on Mars Hill built an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. This God, Paul, is declaring to them and his son, Jesus Christ. And that is what the study of this book, The Origin of the Trinity, is about. To get to you to the understanding that God is one, there's one God overall. This is, by the way, a very interesting um, playlist of a few videos I have on my English-only channel so far with, uh, um, that is brought by uh, Sean Finnegan, uh, who I do not support, but uh, that reading is just wonderful. And that's why I uploaded all these 14 videos in one playlist, one God overall. I will put the uh, link to that playlist in the description box of this video. And then you can have a look for yourself. I will also put, of course, a link to this book in the description box of this video on my archive.org. So you can download it for yourself and read it for yourself. Or you can read along with my study. Um, the point that I want to make is the people in Berea that, uh, that uh, was speaking to here in, in, in the book of Acts <coughs> or in Athens yeah, when Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and uh, ye men of Athens when he spake to the men of Athens he makes to them known the unknown God they pray to. Now the problem is when you pray to an unknown God you're probably not praying very much the way that he loves to be prayed to. Well, let me uh, explain. 
when you pray the rosary to Mary, and by that you want to get through Jesus Christ to the Father, you are not going to get there. Because Mary is not a mediator. Mary is nor co-mediator, nor co-redemptrix. Mary is a dead woman waiting for the resurrection, who was in need of a savior like we all. And she says so in the very first chapter, I think, or the very first chapters of the book uh, of the Gospel of Luke, when she met Elizabeth. Um, my God, my, my no, no uh, she said um, something about the Savior there. We, we can look that up in the study when the study is so far. As I said, I'm, I'm, I'm flying alone here. <laughs> Have no script. Have no script. Just want to tell you what the study is all about. Now, um, to sum it up, because we are going to watch a video together, which I have already a few years uploaded on my uh, English-only channel, um, which from the title I find very important. I'm not 100% behind all of the teaching in there, and not this kind of teaching anyway. That's not my. That's not my my, my prerogative. But I want to give you a little message with that video. But first of all, I want to outline the books I'm going to read. I have read already with Tom Frest, Exploding the Israel Deception, to expose the damnable lie that futurism is. And that is a very, very big part of the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. But futurism goes much further than that what we have spoken about in the book Exploding the Israel Deception. Futurism goes much, much, goes much further than the deception that we spoke about in the book End Time Deception by Steve Wahlberg. It goes so far that we have to do a complete new study of the book of Daniel, many things Paul taught, and of course the book of Revelation. We have to understand that the book of Daniel is the key to open up the understanding for the book of Revelation. We will understand many, many things anew. That is what we're going to study. And then we are going to read another book, um, that is called um, The Only True God by Eric H. H. Chang. It has more than 500 pages and deals also um, f foremost, I think, if not ex exclusively even, with the Gospel of John showing us that Jesus was and is a man. It is a man now sitting at the right hand of God having all authority over heaven and earth because it was given to him by the Father. That's the subject that I actually wanted to talk about. So, what I announced in the video before is going to be a study which I chose to call Yea, Hath God Said. That study will encompass four books of which one already has been read end time delusions and exploding the israel deception it will further contain the book the origin of the trinity of uh, doctrine of the trinity another book which title i don't tell you right now because the book hasn't even finished yet it needs still two or three months to be finished and then i hope that we are going to read this book with two or three brothers in Christ together and those videos then I will put in this playlist yay of God said and then we will finish off with the book the only true God by Eric H. Chang which is also available as a PDF and I will put it even up on my archive.org at the appropriate line time so once again the point why I call the study yay have God said is because this is not only what the serpent said in the Garden of Eden to Eve. This is what speaks to us every day when we are in this world, doubting the word of God by what is taught to us in this world, what is taught to us by other men, what is taught to us by quote-unquote authorities, whether they be of political authority or they be of church authority. Or they are of a authority they assume because we just watch videos. We always have to ask ourselves, Yea, has God said? Yes, God said. I'm going to show you in the Bible. We're going to be good Bereans. We're going to measure everything at the word of God. 
We will see if those things are so. We will back everything up with the Bible itself. This is the purpose of the study. Yea, hath God said, Is there a seven year tribulation? Is the 70th week of Daniel future? Is there a future Antichrist? Is Jesus God? Is the Holy Spirit God? Is God three and one? Or is God one? And a brother of mine from Netherlands prepared a wonderful intro. And that intro I will play to the next video, which will be the first part of the study. Now, this video here, we finish now with watching a video that I will play for you at the end. And that video is called Better Alone Than In Bad Company. But of course, in the video, the point is discussed, is bad company, a bad company is not as bad as being unpopular. <laughs> Well, I happen to disagree, and I think that every Christian is going to disagree, because how can two walk together with, with, uh, lest they agreed, huh? as it says in the book of Amos, if I'm not mistaken? Better alone than a bad company. You know, when I made the decision to do the study openly that I'm going to do now, that I announced today, I knew that I probably will lose a lot of subscribers. I will probably lose even a lot of quote-unquote Christian friends that I thought to have because uh, of the subject that are subjects that are discussed here. But you know, all the friends in the world are not a millionth part worth of that which the only friend that I want to have is, and that's Jesus Christ. I need Jesus Christ to be my friend because he is the only mediator between God and man, as written in 1 Timothy. He is the one through whom I get my salvation. He is the one who says that he is the truth and the life. and the way. So I have to walk his way to come to the truth and to come to everlasting life, eternal life. And because this life in this world is so horrific and is even going to be more horrific, I long to be with the Lord. To me, Christ is life and death is gain. But until I die, I will preach Jesus Christ being the Son of God, not God the Son. I will preach against futurism and I will preach Biblicism. And not in the way that you can look it up on Wikipedia and they tell you what Biblicism is. I understand Biblicism to understand that reading and studying the Word of God, the Bible, the Holy Scripture, alone, without any man's interference, is the basis for my morals and is the basis for my behavior. I want to behave the way that God said I should behave. I want to pray to the God who says of himself, I am that I am, Yahweh, who says, I am God and there is none else. I want to pray to that God in spirit and in truth, and I want to learn anew to love my Heavenly Father, Yahweh, with all my heart and all my soul and all my might and all my power, as Jesus answered in Mark, I think 12, 29, when he was asked, what is the first and foremost of the commandments? And Jesus Christ repeated Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. 
Now, watch out for the video to come. And I hope I can welcome you to the upcoming study. And I hope I made you curious about it and that you stay with me. And if you don't stay with me, as long as you stay with Jesus Christ, read your Bible. Shalom. Maranatha. And I'll begin with a little illustration. Have you ever uh, walked into a room where there was a bad odor? I know you have. We've all experienced that. But the longer you stayed in that room, the less you noticed that the odor bothered you. Until finally, you did not smell it at all. Somebody would ask you who just walked in, don't you smell this odor? And you say, not anymore. Your nose has made an adjustment. Let us imagine that you are in such a room, and then I move you to another room where the odor is even far more offensive than it was in the first room. Again, the same process will be repeated. You'll be at first very bothered, but since your nose has already adjusted to the first odor, it will not be long until you find yourself tolerating this new odor. Again, let me say, I move you to another room. This time, the odor is far worse than the first and the second put together. But again, your nose has already adjusted to the first two, and it will not be long until it adjusts to this third, far more offensive odor. If you walk into this third room, fresh out of the outside air, you will run right back out because you would say, I can't stand the smell in this room. But you see, as you adjust yourself down to this third room, your nose becomes accustomed to the and it doesn't bother you anymore. Now, this imaginary experiment illustrates our next lie that the devil tells with great success. Here it is. Bad company is not as bad as being unpopular. Bad company is not as bad as being unpopular. No matter how many times you hear this sermon preached, it seems it goes in one ear and right out the other. If there's one lie that is so popular, it seems like no one pays any attention to what God has to say on this issue. Everyone just seems to go right ahead and believe the lie of the devil. And that is, bad company is not as bad as being unpopular. Now, the devil in the Bible is portrayed as the tempter. That is, he seeks to draw men away from God and draw men into that which God forbids we call this sin. But Satan directly, I feel like, does not tempt most of us, and I have talked about this in prior broadcast. He can only be one place at one time, dealing with one person at that time. So I doubt if any of us are really directly attempted by Satan, though we use that term. But there are plenty of evil spirits and demons around to satisfy him and get us to be tempted just as he would do if he could do it himself. But normally what Satan does is he gets people to do his tempting work for him. We live in a world where minds of people work upon the minds of other people where the battle that takes place is the battle of thoughts, where people themselves become the biggest influence on other people. That's just the nature of being human beings living in this world, unless you live as a hermit out in the middle of the woods. People will do the normal influencing of other people. And this is the one thing that makes the world such a dangerous place for Christians to live in. You're going to come in contact with the thoughts and the ways of other people. Their expressions, their demands, their feelings, their viewpoints, their ideas, their wants, their wishes, 
these things all get expressed in print, on the news, on television, in movies. I mean, we are bombarded with what other people think about almost everything. Are they right? Are they wrong? These are decisions all of us must make. And so the mindset of the world is broad, but the mindset of the world is constantly flooding us with its views, with its conclusions, with its ideas, with its beliefs. And by the way, most of these are normally not the same as God's. That is, they are against what God stands for. So we have a tremendous amount of influence, information feeding into our mind, influencing our thoughts, that is really anti-God. In John 17, 14 through 18, Jesus said, I have given my people, my disciples, my followers, your word, Father, and the world hates them, implying the world's going to hate the world too. That's why I hate them, because they're not of the world, but I'm not of the world either. I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them Safe from the evil. Now, you could say the evil one, or the evil of the world's people, or the evil of the world culture. And I believe you would be correct in all those things. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, now I send them into the world. And so we are in the world. We are not to run away from it. We're forced to live in it. We're forced to work in it. But at the same time, we are not to be a part of it. That is, to allow it to place us in its mold. To take us away from what we believe to be correct according to what Jesus Christ has taught us in the Word. Jesus makes it clear that his followers will not be popular. Now, remember what the saying of the devil is? Bad company is not as bad as being not being popular. Being unpopular is the worst thing in the world that can happen to you, says Satan. Jesus says, I'm telling you right now, you be a follower of me, and you are not going to be popular. So you have to get that out of your mind. It, it, it's, not Im, it's not impossible for you to be popular with the world. You can be popular with God's people. You can be popular with God, but you can't be popular with the world because the world is anti-Christ, anti-His commandments, anti-His way, anti-His authority. And thus, if they're not if the world finds Christ unpopular because of what he is and what he's like, he's going to find us unpopular because we're going to be just like Jesus. Now, it shouldn't upset you to find that you are ostracized at the office. It should not bother you if you find that people don't invite you to certain parties and certain functions and certain outings. They don't want you. Why? Because of your close association to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Christ makes that very clear. So it shouldn't sadden you if somebody doesn't invite you to their worldly function because you wouldn't fit in. And so I think we have to get accustomed to this. And if you lose their admi admiration and you lose their friendship and you lose popularity with them, then you have lost nothing really worthwhile as far as the Bible says, to really be more specific, Christians are commanded to make bad company totally off limits. Scripture takes the view that you're better off to be alone, to be a loner, than to be in bad company. Now, that's the, the commandment of Scripture. That's the viewpoint of Scripture. That's the conclusion of Scripture. And so while walking with Christ in this world, you're going to find, I believe a lot of times, you're going to end up being a loner. And that's why it's good to have Christian fellowship. The world is not really going to beat a path to your door. They are going to make you a loner. In a real sense, that's the only way that 
you can guarantee your own spiritual safety from the influence of bad companions. Stay away from them. Psalms 1.1, Blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Now, here is where our three-room order experiment, I think, is to be applied, to be observed. Bad companions come in three odors, if I can use it that way, or, or three categories, three levels of smell, three levels of stink. How you want to do it? Each one progressively worse. First you have the ungodly, the room where the ungodly gather. Then there's the room where the sinners gather. And then there's, last of all, the worst of all, the room where the scornful gather. Now, before describing the differences between these three, there's a point that I, I think I ought to make. If a fellow Christian, if a person professing to be a Christian falls under the influence of a bad companion, they become popular with the world, sacrificing their Christian stand, their Christian moral, their Christian conduct, their Christian ways, then they are just as dangerous as a bad companion of the world. A backslidden Christian is no fit companion for a person who wants to walk with the Lord. The true unsaved of the world are unfit companionship, and the backslidden Christian is also unfit companionship material. You have to put them both in the same category because now both of them are going the same direction in the world. And the Christian who was strong for the Lord has now compromised and is now popular in the world. But at the same time, that makes him, of course, off limits to you. Romans sixteen seventeen. Now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them. Them would be the other brethren. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses in the church contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid those people. 1 Corinthians 5.11 I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an adulterer, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, don't even go out and eat. Ephesians 5.11 have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. If there is a person in the church who is doing works of darkness, have no fellowship with them, but rather reprove them, for now they have sacrificed and compromised themselves. Proverbs 14:7. You go from the presence of a foolish man as soon as you perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. Listen. And you can pretty well find out soon, within a matter of minutes, whether or not a person is going to be fit companionship for you. Just listen to them talk. And as soon as you find out, and you perceive, and you discern, hey, this person is not concerned about walking in the ways of God. This person is not concerned about keeping the commandments of Christ. This person is not concerned about pleasing the Lord. At that point, it says, you go from their presence, cut off fellowship. Now, back to our three odious groups. Number one, the ungodly. The term that I think a lot of people get confused here, it just means non-godly. Not only ungodly, but non-godly. And all that they talk about, they don't talk about God. That, that's, that kind of puts them in this category. That's what makes them rather dangerous. They, they just don't talk about God. They don't have no fear of God, they express. They do not try to please God. They speak of no satisfaction with God. They speak of having no pleasure with godly things. I mean, it's just an off-limit subject. The attitude is, we can get along real good if you just don't talk about God. We'd be better off in our relationship together with each other if you just forget to talk about God. 
Let's put God on the back shelf while we're together, and we'll talk about other things of our own choosing. Let's just not get on the subject of God. There's some folks say, I'm not going to discuss politics with anybody. Well, there are a group called the ungodly and say, I'm not going to discuss God with anybody. Now, you see, that's what we're talking about here, ungodly. Let's just forget about Him. Let's get Him off our minds. Let's not let Him find a way into our conversation. Let's not be concerned about what He has to say on any subject. What He wills or does not will, let's just be non-godly. Let's just don't talk about it. And that's the way we can have fellowship. We can get along real good if we just don't get on the subject of religion and God. Stay off of it. Well, the folks like that don't want to talk about the Lord. That puts them in a group that stinks. For you now. Now, the second group, this group has a little bit stronger odor, you see. This is the seed of the scornful, the sinners. And the scornful is the third group. The sinners are mentioned as the second group. Now, we have moved from those people who just say, let's don't talk about God, to people who are actively engaged in acts of sin. They are actually doing what you know is a, the breaking of one or two or three or more commandments. These are rebellious people. They invite you to do things that are absolutely forbidden. Let's go out and have an affair. That's forbidden. But these people will suggest that you both get involved in something that is against the will of God, and you know it. To this group, sin is pleasant. Sin is fun. Sin is in. And it will be the topic of their conversation, the topic of their jokes. It will be the goal of their life. This is what they're going to dwell on when they talk to you. And these people will be planning and plotting all kinds of sinful events. Looking forward to them. Parties and so forth will be of the sinful nature. And they'll be restless until the sin they want to commit is carried out. Sin will be ever on their mind. It will be ever on their lips. And if you're going to go with them, you're going to talk and walk in a sinful atmosphere. Proverbs 4. 4 through 16, enter not into the path of the wicked, the sinful, the evildoers. Do not even get in the way of these people. Avoid their path. Pass by it. Turn from it. Run away from it. For these kind of people do not even sleep, except first of all they had in their imagination done mischief, plotted and planned the next day's sinful event. And their sleep is taken away. That is, they just can't go to sleep until they satisfy their imaginary sin. Unless they cause somebody else to fall. And guess who that somebody else is going to be? You. You. They plot your downfall. They plot your downfall into sin. They want to get you involved in their sinful ways. They might even commit sin with you. You become the victim of their lust and their desire. And so, you know, this... Of course, uh, this is not a group that you want to walk with. So if you're going to be popular with this group, you got to do what they want. No, you just, just forget this group and be a loner. Then you move to the third group, which is the worst of all. And this group, evil is seen to be good. And good is seen to be evil. Now, this group mocks those who are righteous and defies God's warnings about sin. They score anything associated with God's work, curse out God, despise His commandments, mock His ways, joke about God, shakes His fist in God's face, and proclaims allegiance to the forces of the devil. He works to get God set aside, to get His Word set aside, to get God's will set aside. You've got people today in politics doing that. I mean, they are really scornful. They want to shut down everything that's got anything to do with God. They don't even want God mentioned. And they'll go to court and sue you 
That's the scornful people. You don't need those kind of people to be popular with. These people actively work to advance the works of darkness on this earth, to legislate that which the Bible condemns. Now, a very obvious reason that you want to avoid these three groups of bad company is that they always demand you're doing what they want in order for you to gain their friendship. You always are going to be required to adopt their way of thinking, accept their course of action, accept their counsel, and agree with them and go along with them if you're going to be a companion of theirs. If you're going to be popular, you will have to do exactly as they wish. They will not do as you wish. They're not going to straighten their lives out to have your friendship. They're going to corrupt you or kick you out. Now, whether you recruit them or they recruit you, the same rule applies. You will conform to their standards or else. The else being, they will ridicule you and then they will reject you. There will be no room in their circle for you unless you conform to their standards. And they will lay the law down to you. This is the way you will do it if you're going to run with us. Well, then just don't run with them, folks. They'll say either become one of us or leave us alone. Well, leave them alone. That's my, that's my sermon. The companionship of not one ungodly, not one sinner, and not one scorner is worth the price that you have to pay to join up. Just don't join. They should be viewed as people who have a, a contagious disease, like the plague. Don't even get close enough to their company to get infected, because that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to get infected. And you can't get far enough away from these kind of people as far as God's concerned. I mean, stay clear of them. 2 Corinthians 6.17 Come out from among the unbelievers and be separate, saith the Lord. Come out and be separate. To walk with the Lord, you're not going to be allowed by them to walk with them. Make your choice. Do you want the companionship and popularity of Christ or do you want the popularity and companionship of the world? You can't have it both ways. You can't. He says, come out from among them and be separate. You avoid them when they draw near, and you avoid the places where they go, and you sure don't go around with them. You don't want to give your spiritual nose any time to adjust to an unhealthy atmosphere. You want to work your way out of the company of anyone who appears to be non-godly, sinful, and scornful just as rapidly as you possibly can because you are the one that is in immediate danger. They are not. You are. They're not going to get hurt. You are. They're not going to get in trouble. You are. You're the loser. They will not lose. They will not conform to you. They're not going to walk the path of God for your sake. They don't need you. They don't want you. And that's what Jesus is saying about my people, the world will hate, but they hated me too. And so bad company is a trap the devil sets to lure the Christians away from their walk and their allegiance to Jesus Christ. Just get them tied up with the wrong crowd and they'll go the way of the wrong crowd. And the evil that seek out your company under the inspiration of Satan will not rest until they get you to be evil. I want you to understand that. They have a mission in life. Our mission is to make people what? Christ-like. Satan says, I'm going to make my people's mission to make them un-Christ-like. Do you understand that? They have a goal. It's as you and I should have a goal. To win the lost and to sanctify the saved. They have a goal. To make the saved sinful. 
worthless to God, an embarrassment to God, to corrupt them. That's their goal. Their driving missionary ambition is to make God's people do evil. And they'll not rest until they can either get you to do evil or you leave them alone. We are called to stand separate, even if we have to stand all alone. And Jesus says the loneliness will be worth it all. It's the only way you can stand. So many people make a big mistake here, especially in selecting somebody to be their marriage partner. I mean, folks, you really have to be cautious in this area, above all areas, is picking yourself someone to marry. I know it's hard to find good people who walk with the Lord. But keep looking. You can't step back into the world to find a person that's going to be a compliment and a benefit and a blessing and a help to you in the Christian walk. You have to stay separate from the ungodly, the non-godly, and the sinful, and the scornful. It just has to be that way.